So welcome again, everybody, for the last uh, plenary session of this LIBER annual conference. Uh, we will have the pleasure to listen to Dr. Andres uh, Guadamuz of uh, University of Sussex, UK, whom uh, we invited to speak about copyright, open science, and challenges for research libraries. So Dr. Guadamuz, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thanks very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me and also to uh, Dr. Lucy Gibo, who I understand uh, recommended me uh, uh, when, when she was approached. Uh, uh, I was uh, lucky that she couldn't be here, so you, you, get, to, you get me. Um, uh, I come to this topic from, uh, uh, from long uh, time in researching uh, open source, particularly open science in general, uh, and a little bit of uh, open access, actually. I, I, uh, um, I've been involved in some of this from the research perspective of a legal academic. I am a lawyer, so uh, you have no idea how daunting it is to, to, to uh, stand in front of a, uh, of a full uh, room or a room full of uh, uh, librarians. Uh, Panics from ancient times uh, come to me. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm an academic lawyer, so I'm one of the good ones, I think. Um, I've been doing a lot of work, and my perspective in this is a, 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 a lot of uh, very heavy involvement in Creative Commons. So uh, a lot of the perspective that I have in the open access movement has been from uh, 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 tinted very heavily with involvement with Creative Commons. I've been, uh, I was part of uh, uh, CC UK when it was initially CC UK. Then we split, we voted yes, and we, uh, we uh, became Creative Commons Scotland. And now uh, uh, I'm working with Creative Commons Costa Rica, which uh, I'll explain a little bit in a second. Um, I, I, my perspective then is, is a little bit on that. I'm a licensed geek and I'm very interested in the licenses. So the presentation today is going to be very much general. And, and it's a general overview of what I uh, consider to be interesting legal developments. And already I've been attending many of the talks and I have uh, seen that uh, some of the things that you are talking about uh, are not the same things that I'm interested in. So I'm very interested in seeing uh, uh, whether there is an interaction because, of course, you are at the front line of the, of the battle that is, is being waged. Um, um, I like to start all of my presentations with an apology and a, a story. Now, my apology, I already apologize that I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm also Costa Rican, as I said, so I have to apologize to all English, Italians, Uruguayans, uh, Greeks, who may be in the floor. Uh, and I apologize in advance to all the Dutch people for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we're going to, uh, I don't think we're going to win, but anyway. Uh, my apologies that this presentation is slightly general, so I'm very aware that uh, many of you know uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about because, as I was saying, uh, in my experience, uh, librarians are usually some of the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable people about copyright outside of the, of the legal profession, and often more than, than a lot of people in the legal profession. And it's because, as I was saying, you are at the forefront of the battle. Now, uh, my hope is to continue going through some of the issues that I think are inter interesting until at some point, hopefully, I'm going to say something that you hadn't heard about. So that is my objective for today. And the story is, uh, I've been presenting uh, uh, on, on open source and uh, open access and creative commons uh, for quite a long time. Um, in 2003, I was presenting at a legal conference in, um, in Edinburgh. Uh, I was in Edinburgh for many years at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and one of the, uh, um, I was the, the first speaker and I was, uh, uh, no, sorry, I was the second speaker. Um, 
Uh, and I was going to talk about open source and uh, a little bit of a legal introduction to open source. The first speaker was one of these uh, very conservative German uh, law professors. I, I'm, not, I'm not going to mention the name. Uh, it's not important. But he's, uh, it, it was one of those people that you sometimes meet that is, is not only very conservative, but uh, could be accused of being uh, almost unimaginative in, in many respects. And he was speaking before me. And before he presented, he said, by the way, you are going to hear a presentation next about open source, uh, open source software. Uh, I haven't heard the presentation. I don't know the speaker. But I can tell you from the beginning that this is a ridiculous topic. <laughs> this is... Uh, this is a, a fad. This is a, a subject that has no legal interest whatsoever. Uh, all of these licenses, I think, that are invalid. And I'm sure that if they ever get to be tested in court, they're going to be struck down. Because I mean, he, he gave a, a couple of explanations. Besides it being incredibly rude to dismiss an entire field uh, that he was obviously not an expert in, uh, he was also wrong. So I got up, uh, presented, and thankfully I didn't even have to change the slides. One of my first slides was uh, just recently a court in Munich has uh, uh, checked the validity of the uh, GPL, the uh, GNU uh, General Public License, and has been accepted in court and its validity has been Completely accepted. The, the professor was looking a little bit flustered, and, uh, and he didn't even ask a question, and he left the room. I think that uh, uh, that's why I have uh, the, the picture of a cat. I like cats in my, in my presentations. Uh, you're going to see several cats today. Um, and uh, what I have here is that through the years, I've noticed a very interesting change in the debate. First, we started with this idea that whenever I was presenting about open source, I, I was like the communist coming to talk about, uh, uh, about incendiary things. And, uh, I was here to, to start a, a revolution. And that's why I have Chairman Miao uh, here. Chairman Miao, oh, yes, really. Uh, but uh, it's changed the debate. And, and the debate has changed in a, in a way that uh, I think and, and please forgive me if I'm a bit uh, uh, triumphalist in this. I think we won the debate at some point. Uh, it started changing from us being uh, uh, representing radical ideas about uh, uh, that were, could be seen almost like communist. Oh, what do you want? Share information? No. Who's going to pay for it? It was one of the, the things that they would tell us. But the whole idea of openness, the ethos that drives us, has been winning slowly. When we are looking at this from a legal perspective, we are looking at licenses that allow us the use, redistribution, modification, and access to sources. This can be access to source code in, 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 so in open source, for example. This idea of sharing information, that this is good, these are truths that I believe are self-evident, and we have been winning the debate. And the debate has been, win uh, has been won in, in, in almost all of the fields. Open science, I, I, I like to think ab uh, about it as, as the meeting or the reunion of all of the uh, openness movements uh, that share all this idea of sharing information, open access, open data, open source, open content, creative commons. Uh, from from scientific perspective, also things like, uh, at some point, open biotechnology, all of these ideas of sharing information and using licenses or contracts sometimes to share that information. And we've been winning the debate where it matters, in the policy, at the policy level. So it's now understood almost universally that if you are going to use public funds to fund your research, then that research should be made available to the public uh, at some point for free. 
And this has uh, uh, been recognized almost by everyone, uh, the European Commission, the White House has been uh, fostering this, and I could show you slide after slide of how this debate has been won at the policy level, research funding bodies. Now we have a mandate, uh, and, and I've seen an, uh, a lot uh, in, in the last few years, uh, research funding bodies. Uh, in, in the UK, the, the REF, the, the uh, academic exercise that is going to look at our output is going to require uh, open access uh, because uh, we are using public money often. So all of this debate has been won and uh, I, I, I just uh, had to show this. Uh, I, I showed this uh, um, uh, the White House uh, uh, published uh, this uh, open data action plan uh, that is now licensing uh, content on, under uh, CC0. And I love this slide for one reason. I presented it and there were uh, US uh, trade uh, representatives in the room and they just looked like uh, 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 they had bitten a bad apple, uh, to say the least. Uh, because I was saying, I don't want to see sound triumphalist, but I, I think that we are winning the debate where it matters. So, some of the legal developments that I uh, had promised. Um, I'm going to start from the very basic that I think most people in the room are going to know and try to go into some things that maybe you haven't heard before. First, uh, orphan works. I think that uh, by now everyone knows that uh, we had a directive in 2012 um, that uh, has created a regime uh, for orphan works in the European Union. This uh, applies mostly to works in memory institutions and uh, it defines orphan works as uh, those where an author cannot be identified after a diligent search and the diligent search is identified as done with good faith by using appropriate sources, and these are going to be identified in each country through consultation. Now, I won't talk a lot about orphan works, mostly because uh, it's a topic that I haven't really been paying attention in the last couple of years after the directive was, was passed. Mostly because personally I'm waiting for the um, implementation in each country and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, or hoping to see uh, how the directive is going to be transposed in each, in each country. There are already some draft legislation out there and I haven't looked at it in, in, in a lot of detail, uh, to be honest. Uh, if you want to have a look at more information about this. There is a fantastic report from uh, CREATE, uh, people at the University of Bournemouth uh, uh, wrote the report looking at uh, comparative uh, 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 work, looking at the jurisdictions, uh, at seven different jurisdictions. From memory, I think it was Canada, Japan, India, uh, Denmark, uh, and some other countries. Uh, I think they looked at uh, some of the US proposals and also the European approaches. But it's a, a, a fantastic look. And personally, and, and, and uh, I've looked, uh, I'm pretty sure that people in the room have a lot of, uh, of information about this. Uh, personally, I'm waiting for, for the, 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 the dust to settle uh, and to see how, how the, the directive is going to be implemented. Um, then, very important message that I want to convey from a licenses per, uh, licensing perspective is that uh, uh, Creative Commons version 4.0 is out. Um, it, this was uh, done after a very lengthy period of consultation with stakeholders, with, uh, with all of the member states, uh, the, 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 the jurisdictions that uh, had already ported the Creative Commons licenses. licenses. So um, I want to talk about it in a lot of detail because I, I don't want to make this a very CC heavy uh, presentation, but uh, there are two important things about CC4 that you should know about. One is that uh, unlike the previous versions uh, uh, that had been ported, CC4.0 uh, is designed not to be ported. So everyone in the world is going to use the international 
version, the unported version that was, as was known in version 3.0. Uh, so there is not going to be a national port. There is going to be only uh, official translations of the license. And that is, that is the plan at the moment. Before, we had CC 2.0 England and Wales, CC 2.5 Scotland, CC 3.0 Netherlands, etc., etc. You know, we had lots of ports, CC 3.0 Costa Rica. Each country uh, that was interested in importing the license uh, translated it and, and uh, adapted it to, to its own jurisdictions. Uh, this is no longer the case. Uh, the plan with CC40 is the entire world is going to use exact same license. Um, also, the other important thing is that uh, the language has been internationalized, and particularly this is a license that, oops, uh, uh, this is a license that um, uh, allows for uh, the re-license uh, and reuse of databases. If you have been uh, keeping up with the debate uh, with, uh, uh, with what has happened with licensing of databases, 3.0 was a license that specifically did not allow for the re-license of database right in Europe, which led to uh, a forking uh, almost in, in, in the adoption of some licenses that, that led directly to the creation of the Open Data Commons uh, ver licenses, which are designed specifically for databases. Uh, now, this has been uh, changed. Uh, I think Creative Commons accepted that, that a mistake had been made, and some governments as well uh, created their own versions of licenses. I know the UK government created their own government license for the, the open data schemes because uh, the database license wasn't, uh, wasn't licensed uh, or included in the license. And this is the main change on 4.0. So the message that I want to convey to anyone who is already using CC in the repositories is to migrate to CC. Uh, uh, 4.0. I strongly encourage people to, to adopt the new licensing, and uh, I'm sure Creative Commons will be happy to, to help you if, uh, if you have any questions on that. Enforcement, uh, this is something that always comes up. Even now, I, uh, uh, I've been uh, talking about this in, in Costa Rica uh, sometimes, and there is always a lawyer in the room that raises their hand and says, I'm sorry, but these licenses haven't been tested in court in Costa Rica, so they're not valid. And I just, uh, I, I, I just smirk and I, I, so many licenses haven't been tested in court and we are always considering them valid and every time I hear this argument, I just, uh, I just look at them and say, yeah, okay. so you're telling me that every Microsoft license in the world that hasn't been tested in court is not valid. It's, it's, it's an absurd argument. And you can tell them, if they ever tell you that, that there are lots of uh, implementation and, and, and the licenses, and open licenses in general, have been declared valid in court every single time they get to court. There is not a single court that has said these licenses are not valid. Uh, we've had cases, a, a large number of GPL cases in, uh, uh, in Germany. Uh, um, uh, there is a, a very important case, Jacobson versus Katzer in the United States, which was uh, about the open artistic license, if I remember correctly, and lots of Creative Commons uh, cases as well. So every time you hear, and you, uh, maybe you've heard it before, every time you hear someone say, say oh, these licenses have been, haven't been tested in court, it's a lie. It ha they have been tested in civil law systems and in common law system. So I think they're as valid as any other license agreement that, that, that we sign all the time. Uh, this is from a, 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 when you, we, we could still smoke, or you can, uh, I used to be a smoker, you could still smoke in, inside cafes, that picture. And they listen to Creative Commons music as well. Um, another interesting development uh, that I wanted to tell you about is that is that Creative Commons has just released. I um, 
I'm trying to think exactly. I think it was November or, or, or December of, uh, of last year, or maybe it's, it's a bit later than that. Uh, uh, a new set of licenses that are for intergovernmental organizations. Uh, uh, so uh, if you are in any way related to an intergovernmental organization, you can use this license. Now, this is a 3.0 version of the license, of, of the Creative Commons license. Uh, it's a bit complicated because, as I was telling you, 4.0 is not going to be ported. All of the ports that happen, uh, that were negotiated before, are coming out as 3.0. So there are some countries that were lagging behind in the porting process, and those countries are still going to get their version of the license. Now, three, this 3.0 uh, version of intergovernmental organizations is being was negotiated between Creative Commons and WIPO, uh, the European Space Agency, the World Bank, UNESCO, uh, all sorts of very good uh, uh, organizations. And uh, this is out. Uh, the main thing that it contains is an arbitration clause. So, because inter intergovernmental organizations do not like being taken to court, uh, it, it, it was uh, an arbitration clause was included in the license. So. Uh, if you're in any way related to them, this is uh, good news. And also, I think it shows how far we've become from this uh, 2003 when people were dismissing uh, the licenses and the movement, uh, that now it's, it's a de facto standard even for international organizations like WIPO, and the World Integral Property Organization. Uh, they're very, very uh, heavily involved in, in, in this process. Um, um, I know that everyone is aware of CZ0. Uh, I, I didn't put this, I, I, I sort of was uh, thinking that this should be my first slide because everyone now knows what the CZ0 is. The one reason why I didn't put it uh, at the beginning is that there is a little feature that people may not know about CZ0. Uh, CZ0 is a, is a Creative Commons license that allows people to dedicate a work into the public domain. The funny thing is that not every jurisdiction allows uh, uh, users to, uh, to, to dedicate things into the public domain. This is actually, I just wrote, uh, 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 this is a... Uh, a uh, bit of an announcement, uh, personal announce announcement. I just presented and, uh, and published a report for WIPO on uh, copyright relinquishment. Uh, it's a comparative study of jurisdictions looking at which jurisdictions allow uh, you to relinquish or, or, and renounce your own copyright. And it's still uh, ambivalent in many jurisdictions. So there has been a lot of uh, talk and even scholarly works have been claiming that some jurisdictions do not allow you to renounce to your copyright. So that's why we have CZ0. CZ0 acts wherever you can renounce to your copyright, you can renounce it through CZ0. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a public domain dedication, but if your jurisdiction does not allow um, uh, you to, to renounce or, or to relinquish or to dedicate into the public domain, then it works as a license. As a license that operates a, giving you all of the rights just as if you uh, had full, uh, uh, if the work was in the public domain. So it's, it's quite a nice uh, trick that CZ0 pulls. And I think it's something that is not advertised sometimes because you may encounter that your jurisdiction does not allow public domain dedications, and then probably someone is going to say, oh, then you cannot use CZ0. No, you can still use it because it, or it operates as a license. Okay. Um, then uh, data mining. Um, this is a topic that I still think it's legally open. Now, we can assume that if the database is original, then probably it is protected by copyright. I'm saying probably because this is an area of law that hasn't been tested, the data mining specifically. And I think it's going to come down to specific cases and what operation is being performed of the data. Um, I have a study, and there is a, 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 a link to it in one of the uh, later slides, so I'll be happy 
to, to, to discuss this in, in more detail. But generally, I, I still think that the question is not open. But if we are going to be conservative and assume that data mining is protected uh, by copyright, that, that the, the databases themselves or, or by the database right, then um, uh, researchers will need a license. Now, this I, I've seen it discussed uh, a lot, and I'm not going to go through a lot of detail uh, on the legal perspective, because I think that at the moment is open, as uh, many of you know, the UK has just passed a serious uh, series of, uh, uh, of reforms to its copyright legislation, uh, including parody, private copying, we can finally uh, rip CDs uh, legally, uh, imagine, on, it's 2014. Um, but also it allows for, uh, uh, it creates a, 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 an, an exception uh, uh, in, in, in the legislation for mining, data mining for non-commercial purposes, and this is something that has been discussed a lot. Why am I saying that this is not an important legal issue? Because I want, to send a very strong message. Oh, here's one of the cats, by the way. I want us to preempt the legal debate. It doesn't matter, okay, the UK has created an exception, but it's, it's for non-commercial purposes. What happens if you have commercial funding, et cetera, et cetera. Let's preempt the debate by making sure that the originators of research, that is, us as researchers and you as curators of, of, of that research uh, through institutional uh, repositories or libraries, uh, that we are sure that this data is being offered under some form of open or permissive license or you have at least a policy that allows data reuse and data sharing. And I am... Uh, just use open licenses for your work because this is, uh, uh, I didn't put the link, but at the, at the bottom is the name of the report, uh, on, on the, the article that I wrote uh, with Diane Cabell uh, in this topic. And we looked at, this is data from 2012, recorded metadata reuse policies, 59% were undefined. And in recorded full text data reuse policies, this is of UK only, for 2012, 55% were undefined. So please, let's move this. I'm guessing that uh, maybe the figures are, uh, have shifted in, 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 in the two years since, uh, since we did uh, this research. But this is appalling. We should be making sure that repositories, libraries, and, and all sorts of data that is publicly available has a policy that allows a re a reuse, or if it's not allowed, that at least it says stated somewhere. Because I spent days and days and days looking at policies and, uh, uh, in, in repositories, and, in, uh, and it was appalling. Uh, I'm sure that many of the people in this room, uh, if you're here, it's for a reason. You're, 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 you're the ones that are in the, in the minority, but, uh, but we need to change this, really. Uh, we need to make sure that, that all of our policies uh, are stated and, and can, be find, can be found through computers. So that, that is, if you don't get anything at all from this, talk, please at least go to your repositories and to your institutions and try to make sure that we have uh, very clear data. Because then, if we are allowing uh, data mining in our institutions on, 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 on that, uh, at the source, then the legal questions are, uh, are, are moot, really, because it, it's already licensed. That is the whole idea behind open access, I think. Um, just briefly, um, I heard a lot of uh, uh, concerns about APIs uh, uh, in general, and I wanted to just quickly refer to it because it's a, it's a topic that is uh, is of increasing concern. A lot of the interaction with data nowadays occurs through APIs. Now, 
API law usually is governed by contracts, by terms of, uh, terms of use, terms of service, or end-user license agreements. Uh, that is well uh, and fine. Now, because it's governed mostly by contract, it's a subject that you're not going, you're going to be bound by terms and conditions of the API that you're using. Now, what if you want to create your own API? This is already being uh, the subject of some, of some case law. Um, Oracle versus Google is an interesting case where it was a lengthy piece of, 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 uh, uh, of case law. Uh, uh, that wa that uh, had patents, trademarks, and a little bit of copyright. And uh, the copyright part is that Google created its own API uh, that resembled Oracle's API, and they created it in, uh, because they didn't want to pay Oracle royalty fees, uh, in, uh, licensing fees. Um, in the end, uh, um, the ruling found that the structure with which uh, that Oracle had created, in which they had created their API, was not subject to uh, protection. Uh, the same has happened in the UK MECJ. Uh, SAS versus World Programming is a case that, even though it's not specifically about APIs, is about functional elements of software. And the, uh, the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, found that. Um, uh, that functional elements are not protected by copyright, so this could apply or could be used uh, with, with APIs. Okay. A couple of other cases. This is 2004, and I, I, I can't believe that we're still talking about linking uh, in, in, in case law, but ha there has been case law on linking. That means whether uh, this is important for libraries because, for example, uh, uh, aggregator services have been taken to court by aggregating uh, uh, information and linking to it. Uh, for example, this is Svensson and others. Uh, it's, a, it's a Swedish case that made it all the way to the Court of Justice of the European Union. And uh, a group of journalists were writing for the um, for not, uh, newspaper website, and they sued... Retrievers, I'm sorry, I, I can't pronounce Swedish. Uh, uh, well, um, a commercial indexing service which provides its clients with links to articles published by other websites. So the claimants argue that the practice amounted to copyright infringement because it was not clear that they were being directed to a site hosting content in another website. Well, the defendants claimed that their clients knew that the content was hosted elsewhere. This is important for librarians, I think. It's a very important case, because sometimes what you're doing is indexing uh, in information. Now, the court uh, decided that the provision on a website of clickable links to works freely available on another website does not constitute an act of communication to the public, and therefore is not uh, copyright infringement. I, as I was saying, it's crazy and, uh, and amazing that we're still talking about linking data in 2014, but it's something that, that has, been, uh, uh, has made it to court. So I think it's important for you to know that uh, this is finally getting decided. And uh, public relations consultants versus NLA, it's another ca linking case, and it's very similar. So I'm just going to run through it because I'm running out of um, time. Just quickly, if uh, uh, you're going to have access to this, I am part of a project that is looking at creating a, a, a social layer for legislation and case law in the European Union called Open's law, Open Laws. And I would love if you would be able to uh, fill a survey that is linked there. Uh, we are uh, trying to get information from people who, who handle uh, legal information, uh, things like uh, 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 case law and, and, and law. Uh, if you handle that at a, uh, in any of your institutions, we would, would love to hear from you of how your users are using that data. So that's an announcement. Um, my, my final... Um, I've run through... I know it was a, a, a bit of a gallop through, through some legal, uh, uh, legal issues that, uh, that uh, I think are interesting. 
And already these days, I've, I've noticed that there are things that uh, I haven't even beginning thinking about. Linking data, I think it's it's an interesting legal issue. Uh, I haven't even really touched on metadata. Uh, there is like things like copy copy fraud. What happens if something is in the public domain and, uh, and someone is digitizing it? What are the copyright issues of that? I haven't even begun touching on those issues. So I know that, that there are more, uh, more aspects uh, or more legal aspects that I haven't even begun thinking about. I would like to uh, then hear from you and hear from your experiences. And I cannot provide legal services, uh, by the way. Uh, but uh, thanks very much. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much uh, to Dr. Guazan. Do we have a question for him? Thank you. Uh, David Prosser from Research Libraries UK. Uh, thanks for that. It's a, a, a very clear uh, presentation of um, what is a very, for many of us, a very complex issue. It, 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 I'm not actually going to ask a question. I've, I've got a comment because mm -hmm. just now there's been some um, added complexity. Um, the large uh, publishers association, STM, who represent the large commercial um, journal publishers, mm -hmm. have just released a set of rival open access licenses to uh, Creative Commons, so they've created their own licenses that they're going to be promoting. Uh, so these are, um, um, so STM um, has Elsevier, uh, Wiley, Springer and such like as, as their members. And so my, my initial, following an, an initial reading of the licenses, I want to encourage all of us to try and resist um, this because it's going to add greater complexity. It's going to make text and data mining even harder because there'll be so many different licenses and such like. So, mm. you know, if we can, if we can mm. um, stand firm and, and, and promote Creative Commons as, mm. as the, the ideal license for, for openness, I think that would be a very positive thing. Uh, th thanks, thanks very much. Uh, completely agree with that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to sound, uh, as I was saying, I, uh, uh, selling Creative Commons uh, too hard uh, I, uh, because I've worked with Creative Commons, but I think there are very important advantages to using Creative Commons over, uh, even though I was part of, uh, of, of the team that gave rise to Open Data Commons, for example, I, I'm, I'm encouraging now people to migrate to, to, to Creative Commons just because it makes interoperability much easy. Uh, much easier. It's much. Uh, anyone that knows about open source software knows the nightmare that is interoperability between open source licenses. Uh, some uh, are interoperable only downstream, and it, it creates a, a, a huge problem. So uh, I, I encourage people to actually try to maintain themselves in the same licensing environment because it makes sharing much easier. Uh, it, it avoids complex. Uh, interoperability issues, and uh, I'll have to look at the license, uh, uh, these licenses. Uh, all I can say is good luck with that. Yeah. yeah. Do we have other questions for Dr. Guadalos? Hello, uh, Marion Borowski from Fraunhofer Research Center. Um, I didn't follow completely the discussion on the copyright issue concerning the Google snippets okay. of search results uh, presented that might touch us as well. So if we gather um, information and want to present something, can you tell us the, the status of the discussion? What is the copyright status of those snippets and how those um, discussions will end up? Um, so what has been happening with the snippets, uh, um, uh, things like Google News, it has been a uh, subject of, of uh, I, I wasn't really talking about the, the, the snippet aspects, uh, specifically more linking to, to, to data. I know that they have been subjected to, uh, to case, uh, 
to cases and, and litigation in some national countries. Now, I haven't been following too much the debate, but I know that there is there have been adverse cases to snippets in the Netherlands and in Denmark, if I uh, understand correctly. Now, it hasn't made it all the way to the ECJ, and I'm hoping that if it does, uh, it's going to to uh, to receive the same type of uh, of uh, uh, treatment that the linking has received. So, the, the 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 cases that we have at the moment are not of snippets. Uh, they're, they're about linking to data where it may seem that the data is located somewhere else. So, uh, as far as I know, it hasn't it hasn't uh, made it to the to the ECJ. Um, it's unfortunate that some national courts have declared some snippets to be infringing copyright. It's completely unfortunate. Um, I'm hoping that this is just an aberration. Sometimes some national courts do things that that, that we don't agree with. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to find out if, if there have been some other litigation in other countries. Those are the two cases that I'm aware of uh, at the moment. Yeah, thanks. Okay, do we have a last question? No, I have just one okay. uh, thing I would, uh, I don't want to uh, let you go without asking. Um, if a library, as my library, we, uh, we don't have any lawyer in the library. If there is one thing we should do and could do as a library without any lawyer inside, what would be the, the thing you say that you can do and this would be effective to, to be better? Mm. Um, oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm an academic lawyer, so I, I don't like lawyers either. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, j just joking. Um, I, I I would say that uh, having a clear policy. Uh, I know that at least in the UK, I'm aware that a lot of the uh, a, a lot of bodies. I, I know uh, Research Councils UK is a good example. JISC, Sherpa. Uh, they, they have a lot of documentation that allows librarians to bypass legal advice specifically. So any very clear policies is the, is the way to go, I think. Uh, hopefully machine readable, machine searchable, some form of a standard RDF. Now there are lots uh, of uh, uh, formats and technical formats that can allow uh, uh, search engines to read rights. And I think that uh, that can be implemented without any lawyer. So if you have a very clear set of, 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 uh, of policies, is the best way to keep the lawyers away. I would definitely uh, okay, say that. Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Guadamos. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy to do that. <laughs>